and thank you all for, for making the time to attend today. So I want to acknowledge that it's my privilege to be here talking with you, but I'm part of a large team that have been working together to try to understand bipolar disorder and how young it, it might start to affect a person and how we might better recognize it. And we've worked with more than 2,000 families at this point, and most of the funding supporting this work has come from our tax dollars from the National Institute of Mental Health. I have consulted with pharmaceutical companies around neurocognitive assessment, but I haven't received any grants or speakers bureaus um, affecting the, the research that we're going to be talking about today. I also want to acknowledge that I'm part of a large team working on this, and Anna Van Meter and Melissa Jenkins are students who are, are uh, finishing their doctorates and, and moving into new positions, but have been very helpful in, in doing some of the work that we're going to be talking about. The slides that we'll be going through and the ideas that we're going to be talking about are an executive summary. We're, we're going to hit the highlights and introduce some ideas, but if you want to, to get more information about this, please email me afterwards and I'll send you copies of the article that, that lays this out in, in more detail and also copies of measures and some articles related to their use. My goal is to, to give you ideas but also tools that you'll be able to use later this week week in, in working with families. So I want to start off by talking about how common bipolar disorder is in children and adolescents. And I want to, to present some international figures because the perception has been that, that bipolar disorder in kids is a made in USA diagnosis, uh, not seen as often in the rest of the world. And I want us to, to, to look at the data and see, is that actually the case? I also want to give us a sense of how common bipolar might be in different clinical settings. So if you're working in a private practice, if you're working in special education, if you're working in a forensic setting or a hospital, how much does that change the amount of bipolar disorder that, that we're likely to see? Again, the goal is to, to give us tools and techniques that we can use immediately to adjust our index of suspicion. For each person that we're working with, are there warning signs that are making us more concerned that they might have bipolar disorder, or are there things that are reassuring and, and lowering our, our cause for concern? As much as possible, I'm going to emphasize tools that are in the public domain, tools that are free, and if we have a choice between an instrument which is free and an instrument which costs money, if they're equally good, ties are going to, to go to free. And we're going to, to use the, the free instrument uh, because it's, it's going to be more convenient and feasible in a lot of clinical settings. And what I'm going to keep coming back to is how do we use each piece of information to, to guide our clinical decisions and working with people? So this slide is a summary of, of the entire talk, of, of the entire framework for assessing bipolar disorder. Uh, more than, than 15 years of work at this point boiled down onto a single slide. We can break this into three parts. One, thinking like a detective or like a clinician. So the first part is our roadmap to, to better assessment. What are the steps and what's the, the best order for us to proceed with evaluation? And how do we tie that to our next action? How do we tie that to, to what we do next with the person that we're working with? And what do we do next in terms of treatment or assessment? Another way of thinking about this is, is taking all of the information and sorting it into, into three bands of risk. Low risk and high risk, very likely to be bipolar disorder. Medium risk, yellow zone, where we have some warning signs, but we're not ready to say this definitely is bipolar, but it, we're not ready to say that we've ruled it out either. Or the green zone, where the, the person um, 
has has uh, has issues that they definitely want want help with. But we've done due diligence. We've gathered enough information that that we can say with confidence the issues that we're dealing with here probably are not bipolar disorder. So the paper and the talk go through a dozen steps for evidence-based assessment. And these two slides summarize the, the 12 steps, but what we're going to, to do is, is walk through each of these in detail. So the first thing that we can do to improve our assessment of bipolar disorder is be open to the possibility of a bipolar diagnosis. Over and over again, working with adults with mood disorder, we find that a third of patients who, who come asking for help with their depression prove to have some sort of bipolar disorder. So the Federowicz paper uh, is looking at adults seeking treatment for depression. It actually is a 20-year follow-up of people who were treated for depression and who, when they were coming for treatment, they tried to rule out bipolar disorder and still found that 20 years later, a third of them had had a hypomania or a mania, uh, confirming that actually what, what we were working with was something on the bipolar spectrum. Bipolar disorder is the most heritable of the major mental illnesses, and these genes are going to be present from conception. What we are learning is that those genes of risk can turn on in childhood or adolescence. What we also know is that the risk of mood disorder triples at puberty. And a lot of people who are skeptical about the diagnosis of bipolar disorder say, in adolescence, I believe it's the same condition, but I'm not sure about, about before puberty. What we're learning is that puberty is happening earlier and earlier than in previous generations. As young as age eight in the United States now, 20% of eight-year-old girls already have entered puberty. My daughters are 11 and 13. Both of them were hitting puberty around age 10. What this meant to me as a parent is going to, to parent-teacher night. I'm looking around a first grade classroom and, and seeing girls who are already starting to, to mature physically. This hormone change and all of the, the social uh, changes that are happening with it are happening out of synchrony with brain development. The second thing for us to do is to think in terms of a spectrum. DSM-4 and DSM-5 present bipolar disorder as a family of disorders. So there is bipolar 1, but also bipolar 2, which primarily is, is going to, to be depression with episodes of hypomania, cyclothymic disorder, and then bipolar NOS which DSM-5 is going to rename as bipolar NEC, not elsewhere classified. What epidemiological studies are showing us is that, that bipolar 1 is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the rest of the bipolar spectrum is three to five times as common as bipolar 1, people that will have a full-blown mania. But what also is striking from the epidemiological studies is that the people with what we used to think of as a softer version of, of bipolar disorder are equally impaired. They're seeking services at the same rate. They're, uh, they're experiencing a great deal of difficulty. So here we're looking at the, the bipolar pyramid where we have uh, bipolar 1, which DSM-4 and DSM-5 are defining identically, and then bipolar 2 and cyclothymic disorder and bipolar NOS. There's been a lot of discussion about severe mood dysregulation, and DSM-5 is going to propose a new diagnosis of uh, dysregulated mood disorder with dysphoria, DMDD. And the research is pretty clear that, that whatever this condition is, it is not on the bipolar spectrum. It is a, a different, uh, different set of risk factors, different brain processing of emotional stimuli, uh, different family history, probably a different, different course. So we're looking at this, this bipolar pyramid, 
And where we have the most research has been, unfortunately, concentrated on the tip of the iceberg, the course and treatment of bipolar 1 than we do about the rest of the bipolar spectrum. And epidemiologists would say, that's kind of awkward, because, because four out of five people who have a bipolar illness, it's going to be one of these other versions, not necessarily bipolar 1. And what we're seeing, again, is that this rest of the spectrum of bipolar illness still can be quite impairing. So these are data from high school in Oregon. These are teenagers who were well enough to, to get to school. And what we see is that, that bipolar NOS in this group was every bit as impairing as major depression. Teenagers with bipolar NOS were receiving treatment, attempting suicide, having problems with their friends, with their family at school, all at the same rate as teenagers with bipolar 1. The only condition that this study found that was even more impairing than bipolar NOS was bipolar 1, bipolar 2. Looking at data from adults, uh, going and, and looking at an epidemiological sample of adults and reanalyzing it, looking for bipolar NOS, NOS, again, very debilitating in adults, doubling your chances of being on disability or welfare, tripling your chances of, of receiving outpatient mental health services, quadrupling your chances of suicide or hospitalization, a uh, very, very serious condition. Another way of, of looking at bipolar NOS is saying uh, we've got some bipolar features, but what would happen later? What would happen if we came back in, in two years and looked to see whether or not the person had developed a clear mania or a clear depression? That research has been done. The course and outcome of, of bipolar youth study, three-site grant that's been continuing for more than 10 years at this point, found nearly 100 uh, children between the ages of 6 and 12 years old at baseline and then followed them up two years later. And what we see is that about a third of the children uh, two years later no longer had a mood disorder that they met criteria for at the moment. A middle third continued to show this mood junk where their mood was up and down, up and down, but never all the way manic, never all the way sinking into a major depression. And another third had progressed to clearly bipolar one or clearly bipolar 2. The four and a half, five year follow up data just were published last summer. And what we see is um, that more and more of the, the youths are relapsing into depression, relapsing into a mood disorder, and we're up to, to about 45% clearly having bipolar 1 or bipolar 2. What we don't don't know is if this grant is able to continue to follow the people until they're into, into midlife, would we see continued progression where almost everyone eventually would convert into a clear bipolar 1 or bipolar 2? What's also intriguing is that about a third of the cases that started off with that mood junk, where their mood was up and down, up and down, and then two years later it was still up and down, up and down, but never a week of mania, two weeks of depression. Four and five years later, that also was the presentation. And so what some people are starting to wonder is uh, that, that presentation where their mood is up and down, up and down, and it's been like that for years, maybe this is the roots of what in an adult we would think of as a borderline personality disorder presentation where it's black, it's white, I love you, I hate you, you're the best therapist ever, you're fired. Um, that sort of chronic year after year of emotional instability. The most intriguing possibility is that there might be a group of people, though, that, that may grow out of the risk for mania. So two large studies done in the general population in the United States and adults find that there's a group of people that, that may get manic during adolescence and early adulthood, but then never relapse into mania later in their lives. And as we're learning more about brain development, it makes sense that, that 
uh, there might be a group of people that have what essentially is a developmental delay in emotion regulation and their brains may mature a little bit later but when those those structures and those regions become fully developed then they may no longer have the risk of developing mania another part of the bipolar spectrum is something called cyclothymic disorder and cyclothymic disorder has hypomanic symptoms and depressive symptoms and they last for a very very long time of, of the mood going up and down up and down without ever reaching full criteria for a mania or a depression this diagnosis has rarely been used clinically in the United States but epidemiologists when they use those criteria find there's a large group of, of children and teenagers that may may fit that description and Anna Van Meter has looked at two large clinical data sets showing that, that it's possible to reliably identify children and teenagers that, that meet this diagnostic label and they also are, are, are considerably impaired so as soon as we start thinking in terms of, of spectrum we're going to, to see a variety of, of possible forms of bipolar disorder in addition to bipolar 1 but what the data are showing very clearly is this is a clinical concern these are, are people who are experiencing a, a great deal of, of difficulty and, and we would want to identify it and, and attempt to help a third thing that we can do is <clears throat> to take an actuarial approach to, to assessment we can think of this in terms of, of detective work we're going to, to be looking for risk factors and patterns and then we're going to, to use uh, an, an, a framework and approach to try to piece the information together but what we're seeing is that, that it's, it's very important to have a game plan of how we're going to organize the information and not try to do it intuitively in our head so making this concrete this is an example that, that we have talked about with more than, than 2,000 clinicians around the world at this point. So I want you to imagine a seven-year-old African-American male who's referred to us because he's always had a lot of energy, always been very distractible, always been getting in trouble at school. And dad's been diagnosed with bipolar one and been treated for several years with lithium and Dival pro -X, And he's done pretty well on, on that combination. What I want you to do is think from zero, no way, there is no chance that this child has bipolar disorder, he's way too young, to 100%, I've heard enough, this sounds like a, a common presentation and a strong family history of bipolar disorder, I, I'm ready to guarantee that this child has bipolar. I want you to think where your personal index of suspicion is, between zero, no way, and 100%, this is definitely bipolar disorder and we asked the clinicians that, that we were presenting this information to to do the same thing and write down that number mom then fills out the child behavior checklist this is like the Microsoft Windows of clinical assessment It is the most widely used rating scale in research and in, in clinical settings when we score this up the externalizing score, the measure of aggressive and rule-breaking behavior, comes back three and a half standard deviations above the mean. If this were an IQ test, this would be genius range. This child is, is an Einstein of externalizing. He's a Mozart of mayhem. And all the research indicates that kids with bipolar disorder tend to score high on this scale and this is a very very high score on the scale what does that do to our index of suspicion knowing this additional piece of information where is your number now from zero definitely not bipolar disorder to a hundred percent definitely bipolar disorder you have that number in mind let's compare that to what we see with more than 600 other clinicians that heard the same vignette had the same hints, the same same clues about a bipolar diagnosis. 
let's look at how they pulled that information together. What we see is literally 100% range of opinion. There were two clinicians that said definitely not, no chance that this is bipolar disorder. And there were two clinicians that said, I've heard enough, it definitely is bipolar disorder. And we have everything in between. If we gave this information to Warren Buffett, an insurance actuary, and said, out of a thousand children that are this young, that are having this degree of externalizing problems in a family history of bipolar disorder, out of a thousand, how many of them might actually already have a bipolar spectrum illness themselves? An insurance agent would say slightly more than half, about 550 out of a thousand. And if we gave the same information to someone to use statistics, to use Bayes' theorem, like data from Star Trek, he would say, based on the prevalence of bipolar disorder in a seven-year-old age population, the positive score on the child behavior checklist and the family history of bipolar disorder, I estimate a 55% probability of the child having bipolar. So when we compare the clinicians looking at the information and eyeballing it and combining it in their in their head and compare that to what an insurance actuary or data from Star Trek would estimate, we see a couple interesting things. One is an extreme range of opinion. Another is that the clinicians are on average overestimating the, the chance that the child has bipolar disorder. The most popular response was an 80% chance and the average was up in the high 70s. Half of these clinicians are from Canada and from outside of the United States, and their description is we're, we're skeptical, we're conservative about diagnosing bipolar, but still had a tendency to overestimate the risk for, for this particular child. The same 600 clinicians attended a talk similar to this one, learned the additional steps that we're going to go through today. What we see here in green is the same 600 clinicians reinterpreting the information using the strategies that we're talking about today. And what we see is that these strategies reduce that tendency to overdiagnose bipolar, which is hugely important, tighten up the range of opinion, and make us much more accurate in our estimates of, of the chance that an individual case has bipolar disorder. Fascinating. So we've seen over the last 20 years a big increase in the rate of clinical diagnosis of bipolar disorder. This paper uh, published in Archives of General Psychiatry has been talked about on national public radio and in the New York Times. So we have this 40-fold increase in clinical diagnoses of bipolar disorder over the same period of time that the definition of bipolar disorder has changed from DSM-3R to DSM-4, which added bipolar 2, uh, added bipolar NOS as categories. The biggest driver of the change in diagnosis is changes in clinical training, changes in the definition that was included in DSM, and changes in how we think about cases. The differences due to training are bigger than the differences that we see across countries in epidemiological studies of how common bipolar disorder is. When we look at agreement between clinical diagnoses of bipolar and research diagnoses of bipolar. Both, both approaches are identifying similar rates of cases, but the bad news is that they're not agreeing very much with each other about exactly which person has bipolar disorder. So um, both clinical diagnoses and research diagnoses are finding that bipolar is, is something that occurs in children and teenagers, probably about a third as common as depression, probably about half to a third as common as ADHD, but not agreeing about which cases are the ones that actually have bipolar disorder. The Kappa statistic is a measure of agreement above chance. Agreement about 
who has bipolar disorder is only about 10% above chance. That's not very good. Uh, that is, even compared to, to other clinical diagnoses, that's, that's definitely not where we would want to, to see it. When we look at uh, ways of trying to increase the agreement, increase our accuracy in deciding who does or does not have bipolar diagnoses, one strategy is, is to, to think in terms of, of the, the probabilities. Another is to recognize that there are shortcuts that our brain tends to use that, that often are accurate, but sometimes will we'll make mistakes. And so this study, which is Melissa Jenkins' doctoral dissertation, looks at presenting a series of vignettes to clinicians and randomly assigning half of them to, to get a debiasing strategy, to get reminders of here are some, some shortcuts that we often use that, that may, uh, may not be as accurate if we're trying to assess whether or not there's bipolar disorder. So half of the participants in, in the project were, were psychologists, three quarters were, were white, 90% uh, were, were doing clinical service as their primary activity. And those that, that got the debiasing intervention, it's very quick. It's a 20-minute web-based tutorial that talks about four different debiasing strategies. Things like if you hear about depression, if a person is asking for help about depression, remember to ask, have you ever been hypomanic? Have you ever had a previous mania? Because to recognize bipolar disorder, it's not just the problem that's bringing them to the office today, it's have they ever had these, these other issues? And hypomania in particular doesn't usually cause problems for the person, so they're much less likely to, to come and seek our help, saying, Doctor, I have too much energy and, and feel like I have too many good ideas, and I want you to make this stop. So learning those four debiasing strategies led to, to much more accurate diagnoses across all four vignettes and significantly fewer errors. And here we're comparing diagnosis as usual, where clinicians just heard the vignettes without the debiasing strategies, versus the group of clinicians that just got the, the four quick tips about ways of, of making clinical decisions more accurate. And we see substantially more accurate estimates of what was going on with each of the vignettes. Another thing which was very encouraging with this study was finding no evidence of race bias. And this is huge because in the United States, if you have a, a mood disorder, particularly if you have bipolar disorder, and you are African American or Hispanic, you are more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia or conduct disorder you're more likely to be arrested and incarcerated than to receive mental health services. So we have this big discrepancy in service utilization. And what this study was able to show is that's not bias on the part of the clinician. When the clinician is hearing identical case presentations, uh, they're making the same diagnostic decisions. Uh, regardless of, of the race or ethnicity of, of the patient or vignette that they're hearing about. So how do, we, how do we capture some of those gains that we just saw from those two studies where the, the practicing clinicians went from the before, 100% range of opinion and overestimating the risk of bipolar disorder, to the after, where they were using the same information and being much more consistent, much more accurate. First thing that we can do is think about where am I working and how much bipolar am I likely to see in the setting that I'm working in. Paul Meal, decades ago, talked about if you don't know anything else, bet the base rate, bet, uh, bet what's likely to be common in the setting that you're working in. If we hear hoofbeats, what's the first animal that we should think of? It depends. It depends on where we're working. Here in North Carolina, safe bet would be horse, but if we heard exactly the same hoof steps in Arizona, it might be a donkey or a mule, and if we heard it in the Serengeti, 
pet zebra. Epidemiologists are finding that bipolar disorder is much more common in the general population than what we were taught. How much we are going to see is going to depend on where we're working. This slide is summarizing the entire world literature about how common bipolar disorder is in children and teenagers around the world. There were 12 studies published, six in the United States, six in the rest of the world, and the average rate was just under 2% in the general population. This number is, is high compared to what we were taught. It also is about half of the lifetime prevalence of bipolar disorder in adults in the United States now. So this is saying it's about half as common as in adults, but still more common than what we had, had been taught in our psychopathology classes. What also is interesting is that there's no increase over time. So over the same 20 year period, the, the clinical diagnosis of bipolar disorder is increased by a factor of 40. Bipolar has not actually become more common in the general population in children and teenagers. A very important take home message from this is that bipolar disorder is not manufactured in the United States. This is not a US only diagnosis. The rate averaging across the six studies in the United States just under 2% averaging the other studies around the world just over 2%. In the time since this paper was, was published, Canada published its epidemiological study. How common is bipolar disorder in Canada in children and teenagers? Just over 2%. My father is a research chemist, and when this paper came out, I called him up and said, Dad, Dad, Canada just published its rate, it wasn't in our meta-analysis, and the rate lined up exactly with what we would have expected based on, on the findings from all the other literature. And my son said, or my father said, son, it's like you're doing science or something. So the rates that we've been talking about are how common bipolar is in the general community. But those of us who are in clinical practice, we're not working in the general community. We're not uh, taking the phone book and randomly dialing people and interviewing them and saying, you might have bipolar disorder. Working in a clinical practice, we're likely to see even more bipolar disorder than the epidemiologists are finding because people are coming and asking for help because they're dealing with, with emotional issues. So here we're looking at rates across different clinical settings and two different approaches, clinical diagnoses, looking at medical records and charts, and doing research interviews, both indicate that about 6% of children and teenagers coming to outpatient mental health services probably have a diagnosis somewhere on the bipolar spectrum. So 6% for those of us working in private practice or outpatient clinics is, is probably a very good starting point. And five or six percent reminds us this could happen. This is something which is worth assessing for. But it also reminds us 19 times out of 20, it's probably going to be something else. It's probably going to be unipolar depression or ADHD, something not on the bipolar spectrum. For those of us working in other clinical settings, more acute uh, settings, if you're working in a specialty clinic, then the rates could be as high as, as 15 or 20%. If you're working in a residential treatment facility or if you're working with an incarcerated population, the rate of bipolar disorder is likely to be higher. If you're working on an inpatient setting or a psychiatric hospital, then bipolar spectrum illness could be a third or even half of, of what you're working with. The next strategy is to gather a detailed family history. Again, we know that this is the most heritable of the major mental illnesses. We also know it's not a single gene disorder. There are probably dozens or hundreds of genes that are each contributing a little bit of risk for developing bipolar disorder. If we have a clear bipolar history in a biological parent or a full sibling, 
that makes us five times more worried about the, the person that we're evaluating developing bipolar disorder. This is a very powerful risk factor. This is more powerful than the link between smoking and heart disease or lung cancer, for example, but it's not the same thing as, as guaranteeing a diagnosis by itself. If we talk with the person and gather the family history and we uh, learn that a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle had, had bipolar disorder, on average that second degree relative will share half as many genes with the person that we're assessing and so that would make us about half as worried, two and a half times as worried about the possibility of bipolar disorder. Gathering family history is, is often a challenge in clinical practice. Um, we've worked on and, and developed a free uh, family index of risk for mood, and this actually is the entire instrument. So it's a half page, just a, a bunch of check boxes saying, do any of your relatives, your grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, other children, have a history of suicide or drug and alcohol problems or depression or mania or hospitalization, and then just count the number of check boxes. And this is not as, as accurate as actually interviewing all of the relatives, but it's a lot more practical in most clinical settings. And very high scores on this count the number of checks will triple the risk of bipolar disorder in the child or teenager that we're evaluating. If you email me and ask for the assessment care package, this instrument is, is one of the things that will be included in the bundle. Looking at rating scales, looking at things like that family index of risk for mood, or looking at the, the child behavior checklist, uh, and, and weaving that in to our evaluation of bipolar disorder can help make our decisions much more accurate. Five minutes of rating scales literally can, can shave years off of the time that it takes us to detect bipolar disorder. Broad measures like the child behavior checklist, if the family fills those out and the scores on uh, measures of aggression and rule breaking behavior externalizing come back low, then we don't need to worry about bipolar disorder in most cases. When we take a condition which is not that common to begin with and get a low score back on a screener, making it even more unlikely, we can pretty much rule it out. High scores on these instruments are not the same as, as confirming a bipolar diagnosis. I think of these more as, as being another, another red flag that's raising our index of suspicion. And what we're learning is that if you get a high score on a measure like the, the child behavior checklist or the behavior assessment scales for children, the BASC or the Connors, then we would switch and ask the family to, to also fill out a hypomania measure. We don't give hypomania measures to everyone that comes to our clinic and we don't recommend universal screening for bipolar disorder because then we would be back to overdiagnosing. But in situations where we have one or two warning signs, where we have some red flags, then we would add a hypomania measure um, and incorporate that into our decision making. And the other thing which I want to emphasize is that although there are commercially distributed measures for, for looking at bipolar disorder now, they haven't published data. And the, the measures that have the best data are the ones that are in the public domain. So here, uh, the best instruments also happen to be the free ones. A seventh thing is to always work to involve a collateral in the evaluation. Anytime that we're concerned that it might be bipolar disorder, we need to talk with a parent. We need to talk with a significant other who is familiar with that person's behavior. Part of the reason for this is that lack of insight is a symptom of hypomania. When a person is getting hypomanic or, or manic, they don't feel ill. 
they're getting swept up into this high energy and this enthusiasm and this 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 drive to to do things, and they don't recognize the effect that their behavior is having on other people. Another issue is that the the symptoms that that make up hypomania and mania are likely to bother other people before they they bother the person who's experiencing them. Denny Cantwell talks about there being two kinds of symptoms in the world, onion symptoms and garlic symptoms. Onion symptoms would bug us when we're having them. Garlic symptoms bug everyone around us when, when we're having them. And mania is a bunch of garlic symptoms. The, the having uh, pressured speech, the person doesn't think that they're talking too much. They've got a lot of ideas and they're just trying to get them out as fast as they can and it's up to other people to, to listen. So the manic symptoms, the symptoms that really would tell us, uh-oh, we're, we're, we're working with a bipolar condition here, are the ones that are going to bother the parent or the peers or other people before the, the person who's getting hypomanic is, is going to recognize them in themselves. What we're seeing over and over and over across every sample that's gathered information from teenagers and from parents is that the parent data does a better job of identifying which cases might be on the bipolar spectrum. An eighth thing that we can do is look for, for changes in, in mood and energy. One of the few changes that DSM-5 is, is proposing to make is tweaking the criteria for bipolar disorder to emphasize changes in energy. So bipolar disorder is, is a condition where people will react very strongly and very emotionally to, to stressors. But what really helps build the case in favor of a bipolar diagnosis is, is having some spontaneous changes, times where the person says, yeah, my energy was really low or really high, and, and I don't know why. The more episodic the presentation, the more that it's clearly a change from, from that person's typical functioning, uh, the more likely it is that we're dealing with a bipolar illness instead of some other condition. Take high energy or poor concentration, for example. Both of these, if we just ask, does this person have a lot of energy? And they say, yeah, I do. Or their parents say, oh, yeah. By itself, we don't know, is that a symptom of ADHD? Or is that a symptom that might be a hypomania or a mania? But if we ask, does that come and go? Are there, there are times that they're like that and times that they aren't? The more that we hear that that comes and goes, the more that that raises our suspicion about a mood disorder, the less that that sounds like something like ADHD. A ninth thing is when we're trying to, to do our detective work and make up our minds about, about might this be bipolar or not, not all of the symptoms are going to be equally helpful in, in confirming a diagnosis. So we want to give more weight to the symptoms that are going to be more specific to, to mania. The DSM-4 and DSM-5 criteria already do this. They, they say if what we're hearing about is mostly irritable mood, we're going to, to need to, to see additional symptoms. We're going to need at least one extra symptom to, to arrive at a diagnosis of mania versus if their mood is getting elated and giddy and goopy, that's more unique to mania. And, and so we won't need as many additional symptoms to, to confirm the diagnosis. The problem for us as clinicians is that the things that bring people to our office, the things that usually are causing the most problems, are not going to be specific to bipolar disorder. So parents are bringing their children in because they get irritable and they get, they get frustrated and aggressive, or teenagers will come and ask for help when they're depressed. Teachers will notice when, when kids are being disruptive or having trouble concentrating. So the number one thing that the parent or the youth or the teacher wants fixed isn't going to tell us what the problem is. We're going to have to, to say, I understand why, why you're here and what you want help with, but I'm going to have to ask about some other symptoms to understand why this might be happening and how we're going to try to treat it. 
The other thing for us to do is to extend the time window of assessment. So to really understand whether or not we're dealing with bipolar disorder often is going to take us more than one session. So we're going to do an evaluation and, and say, based on everything that I know, I'm in the yellow zone. We've got some, some warning signs that this might be bipolar disorder, uh, but I don't have enough information yet to be able to say for sure this is definitely bipolar or we can rule it out and this is something else. This is a challenge for us as clinicians because usually the, the way that our practices are set up, we, we think of assessment as something that we do in the first session and then we come up with a diagnosis, build the treatment plan around that and get busy treating. We need to remember that bipolar disorder is the trickster of the DSM and it, it um, typically when we just approach this the way that, that we usually approach diagnosis typically takes people uh, more than 10 years between when their mood symptoms are starting to cause them problems and when we get a diagnosis of oh this is on the bipolar spectrum so again this uh, bundle of strategies is designed to, to try to literally shave years off the time that it takes us to, to recognize that this is bipolar disorder. And one way of, it, of extending the window of assessment is each time that the person comes in asking, since last session, since I saw you last, how has your mood been? Has it been up? Has it been down? Has it been about in the middle? How has your energy been? So looking for cycling, looking for episodes, looking for changes in energy and functioning is going to, to be the most helpful tool for clarifying, is this bipolar disorder or is this something else? And there are life charts available that people can download or complete online. And now there's an app for that. So there are, most expensive one that I've seen is $4. Uh, apps that, that the teenager could download onto their iPhone or Android device. And what it's doing is each day saying, how is your mood today? How's your energy today? Has it been up? Has it been down? Has it been about in the middle? And as we look at this day-to-day -day data, that's when, when the picture starts to become much more clear about when we might be dealing with bipolar disorder. So here we're looking at a, a paper chart filled out by a teenager, and we see these days they were doing fine, and then these days their mood's starting to get a little bit lower, and then here their mood's going up and down, up and down, and here their energy is high, but their mood's very negative. And so what we're seeing is this rise and fall and this mood instability, which is telling us this is looking a lot more like a mood disorder. Good news for us as clinicians is that exactly the same tools that we would use to try to arrive at a diagnosis of, of bipolar disorder are going to be very helpful in measuring treatment response. So what we're seeing here is that the, the same one-page checklist that we would have a parent fill out to try to get a sense of might this be bipolar disorder are as sensitive to treatment effects as doing a half hour or 40 minute interview with the whole family. So adding a brief uh, mood measure uh, to the standard battery, one page instrument can be very helpful in clarifying the fuzzy cases, also very helpful in measuring treatment response. And then for those of us who are, are doing cognitive behavioral therapy type, type approaches, you can see how the, the life charting uh, builds very naturally into the looking at what, what was happening when your mood changed, what were the triggers, and, and weaving that into, into therapy, saying, okay, what were you thinking then? What would be a different way of interpreting the same situation, and how would that change how, how you feel? And the last thing is for us to be open to changing our diagnosis. One of the things which is very humbling about working with bipolar disorder is we could do everything right in our assessment and, and feel pretty confident that we're in the green zone, that we've ruled bipolar disorder out. And I can, I can think of people that I've worked with saying, okay, this we've, we've done 
due diligence, I'm confident that this is depression, and then I get a phone call saying that they were arrested running naked across the, the school school soccer field, and now they're in the hospital and, and, and talking a mile a minute, well, that changes things. So developing an episode during or after treatment, uh, we need to, to, to be alert to that, make sure to change our diagnosis, make sure to change our treatment plan. Two teenagers with depression, one with unipolar depression and the other with bipolar 2, those depressions aren't going to respond the same way to medication. They're not going to respond the same way to therapy. So thinking about working with, with a patient, uh, very often it's like a, a detective story and we start off saying, okay, you're here because you are, are depressed, you have a family history of, of bipolar disorder. By itself, that's going to, to keep us somewhere in the green zone, possibly starting to get a little bit concerned about bipolar. But then when we hear that their first depression happened when in childhood and it didn't respond well to, to antidepressants, and then we have mom fill out one of the mania scales and it comes back with a very high score, all of these things are raising our index of suspicion. And the thing which would be most decisive would be if the person has a full-blown manic episode, that would by itself set the diagnosis to bipolar 1. But as much as possible, we want to, to try to prevent that and recognize when we might be dealing with something on the bipolar spectrum without waiting for, for that full-blown mania. And whatever level we're at, whether we're in the red zone, this is very likely to be bipolar, or the yellow zone, where maybe it is, maybe it isn't, or the green zone, where we've ruled bipolar out, we have different treatment strategies available, different things that we can do, different ways that we can customize our response to, to, to best meet the, the needs of the person that we're working with. So these two studies showed that very quick interventions, 20-minute interventions, have big effects on how we interpret information to make a decision about whether or not someone has bipolar disorder. The actual time added, if we follow these, these 12 steps, is less than five minutes per patient, and no delay in initiating green or yellow zone treatments. And in terms of expense that we're adding, it's less than $4 if the teenager chooses to download the life charting application onto their smartphone. Everything else that we're talking about here is in the public domain. Everything else that we're talking about here is billable time for us as, as clinicians under the past and current CPT codes. So several times I've mentioned if you want copies of, of the article or measures, please email me and ask for the care package. If you'd like to see the, um, the debiasing strategies, then this URL is the link that would, would take you to that site. Um, and now I'd like to, to take any questions and comments that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that was wonderful. Um, if you guys have any questions, we'll be answering them right now, and you can type them into the question box in the control panel. Uh, the next question is, can we see the URL again, please? Absolutely. And actually, we, um, we, this is very, very real life. So Melissa is now out in San Diego. So she's finished up at, at uh, University of North Carolina, but after she moved, uh, got a grant to extend the project. So if you have the time and interest to, to go there, there's actually a, a gift card for, for people that are able to, to go through and, and complete the ratings.
great. And we'll just wait one more second. I think we have a question coming through. What are the prevention strategies for those with a family history who do not meet diagnostic criteria? I'm sorry, I lost the beginning of the question. Uh, this question says, what are the prevention strategies for those with a family history who do not meet the di diagnostic criteria? The prevention strategies would, would be the same sorts of things that we would recommend for preventing depression in general. Um, so, so good coping skills, um, good emotion regulation, um, good sleep hygiene winds up being being very very important. So practical things like if the if the person has a, a computer in their room or a TV in their room, move it out and and make sure that they're they're getting to, to sleep at a regular time. Um, the electronics are are one of the single biggest uh, disruptors of our our sleep cycle and. For people who are at risk of bipolar disorder, messing with their sleep very often is a powerful trigger of, um, of hypomania and, and mania. So much so that international flights um, between New York and London, for example, have much more people getting hypomanic or manic on the flights that are red eyes going from New York to London than planes coming back the opposite direction flying during the day. So disruption of, of sleep, very powerful trigger. Thank you. The next question is, what is the increase of likelihood of an adolescent child age 13 having bipolar with a mother, aunt, and second cousin with bipolar and two second cousins with uh, uni, uh, unipolar? Wow, that is that is quite a family history. the The way which I would approach that would be to um, to to estimate a high and a low, uh, sort of a conservative and a liberal chance, and and say it's probably somewhere in this zone. So each so it was <laughs> it was mother, mother, grandmother, and aunt. So and you would. If you were doing this, if you were doing this with the the probability connect the dots nomogram approach that we talk about in the article, you would start off saying, "How worried was I about this child before knowing the family history?" And then mom's making us five times more worried, grandmother's making us two and a half, so you'd multiply those two together, so we'd be up to. Uh, um, uh, 12 and a half times more worried based on that. And then the family history of depression might make me twice as worried. So that, that family history could be making us 25 times more concerned about bipolar disorder for that teenager. And you would, you'd go ahead and, and plug all that in, connect those dots. And that would, that would put us up at, um, depending on on what that teenager was was seeking help for if they were coming in seriously depressed with that kind of family history it's very likely that, that we are dealing with something on the bipolar spectrum then versus if they had the same family history but they were doing well at school didn't have any history of depression that's someone who's still we would want to watch and 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 Watch, watch and wait, but watch closely. Um, but but if they're having a mood disorder with that kind of family history, very likely that, that we would want to treat that, even if it's just depression that they're seeking help for, we would want to treat that as very likely to be a bipolar depression.
So it looks like people are still on, but it's very, very quiet. I was muted, but we do have another question. The next question is, are there suggestions for how this information could be used for those who are working as certified peer support specialists? For certified peer support specialists, I think um, that all of these these strategies are are potentially potentially relevant. So, if you start to to hear about about a family history, or or you're hearing about about risk factors, um, or if if the person fills out the the checklist and and it comes back high, then that's something to to talk about and. I don't think that, that we don't have data that would show that everything on the bipolar spectrum immediately um, needs medication, and we're not sure how much medication would help with cyclothymic disorder. There, there is no clinical trial for that yet. Um, but therapy, whatever you're doing in in peer support, I think that uh, if you have someone that has some bipolar risk factors or or bipolar features what that's telling us is that that their emotions are very likely to change a lot the and 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 so recognizing you may have a, a very short fuse or a very short a very re a hair trigger um and respond very strongly to things how's how's that playing out for you with your friends how's that playing out for you with your family learning this about yourself, what are things that you could do um, to, to pause and, and not say something in the heat of the moment that you'll regret later. Um, so I think that, that it becomes more information. But if you're clearly dealing with, with mania, clearly dealing with, with bipolar one, then you would want to support the person and encourage them to, to talk with a mental health professional that's going to, to be able to use the tools to help uh, help deal with that acute mania. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that answer. So that the was part, our last question. The, the part which is which is which is missing is is as we're going through the questions, I'm nodding my head and I'm waving my hands and uh, um, so I hope the enthusiasm is coming for, coming through even though you can't see all the gestures. No, it was wonderful and we heard the tapping with one of your slides. <laughs> So thank you. We really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And if you have any additional questions or want to learn more about the care package, um, you can email me as well and I can put you in touch. Um, so thank you again and have a wonderful day. Thank you all.